Well, uh, let's continue to preach through or teach through 1 Kings, and we're in chapter 15. And so we see that the kingdom has been divided. There is a northern kingdom of Jeroboam, and uh, then there's a southern kingdom of Rehoboam. And the southern kingdom, of course, is ruled by David's grandson. And we saw that Jeroboam erected two idols of golden calves, Mm -hmm. one in the north, Dan, and one in the south. And so he said, Jeroboam sent his wife to try to see if they couldn't consult with a real man of God and save their son who was sick, but though she tried to disguise herself, the blind prophet saw right through her (laughs) because the Lord had told him uh, how devious uh, Jeroboam and his wife were being, and sure enough, they lost their son. And so there continued to be strife between the northern and southern kingdoms. So now we get to the point today of 1 Kings chapter 15. Mm -hmm. So let's read these first eight verses together. 1 Kings 15, 1 to 8. Now, are you looking for your Bible, Paul? No. You know where it is? Yes. Because I noticed there's somebody's got a Bible in in the van back there. Or the back seat of the van. Somebody ought to go back there and get it, I guess. But let's look at 1 Kings 15. Now, in the 18th year of King Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, reigned Abijam over Judah. Three years reigned he in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Mekah, the daughter of Abba Shalom. And he walked in all the sins of his father, which he had done before him. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, for David's sake did the Lord his God give him a lamp in Jerusalem Mm -hmm. to set up his son after him and to establish Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Because David did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord and turned not aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, save only in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all the days of his life. Now the rest of the acts of Abijam and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And there was war between Abijam and Jeroboam, And Abijam slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David. And Asa, his son, reigned in his stead. Mm -hmm. Amen. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Father, that Mm -hmm. there is this wonderful principle that even though we, the children of our forefathers, may not be worth much, thank God we can have founding fathers and forefathers that loved you and uh, were worthy of your blessing. (coughs) so that we can even continue as we are today as a nation because of the light of our forefathers and how that they did walk with you and loved you and respected you and believed your book. Though, of course, today uh, we don't today, and boy, aren't we in a mess. Thank you, God, that you still bless us and honor us because you are still honoring them and their walk with you. And help us to see that and understand these things as we read this today and in Jesus name we ask it and amen. Amen, amen. You know it is said that in the Old Testament we see how God deals with nations Mm -hmm. and in the New Testament we see how God deals with individuals and there are some great truths here as we see God establishing these nations and how that they had some good founding fathers Mm -hmm. and because of that relationship God continues to recognize that light that we have and that we've had. Thank God for our forefathers and thank God for the Constitution and how it maintains as a standard for us even in these end times that we can try to hold 
our politicians' feet to the fire because, for sure, the present administration has totally violated that Constitution. Amen. And uh, we know that they're in a heap of trouble. But we, being God's true saints, we can rest knowing that he's able to hide us in the hollow of his hand Amen. during the times of judgment that we see coming on our country and in our nation today. Amen. And so that's why it's easy to keep serving the Lord because there are so many benefits to serving the Lord. Amen. And so many people we live with don't have those benefits that's and right. don't know the Lord that's true. and are living in total agony and chaos. Uh -huh. And the suicide rate is very much uh, the proof of that. Mm -hmm. So it's of some interest, I say, that the Bible referred to David there. Verse 4, Nevertheless, for David's sake did the Lord his God give him a lamp. Isn't that a fascinating term? Mm -hmm. Give him a lamp mm -hmm. in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. A lamp in Jerusalem. Because again, because David was such a great man of God and loved the Lord. And that even though his sons and grandsons may not be as high a caliber, still there's a little bit of light there. Yes, right. And uh, people are moving forward with what illumination that they have. Amen. And the book of Hebrews warns us that uh, I hope you've been saved and you're serving the Lord. How that, but after ye were illuminated, mm -hmm. see, the devil don't like you being a light. Mm -hmm. So right. he's going to start coming in around you just as much as he can and, and put darkness in your way and try to get you to fall and trip and try to make some difficulties for you since, again, you know you're the Lord's and you belong to him and God's going to keep his promises. Yeah. Let's look at Second Chronicles. This business of a lamp. Second Chronicles 21 7. Second Chronicles 21 7. You are the only lamp some of your fellow workers at work know. That's right. You're the only light they have. You're the only epistle read of all men, Paul said. That's right. Some of us are the only minister some people have. And we teach every member of ministry. Amen. Mm -hmm. And so Second Chronicles, what did I say? 20? 21, 21. 21 in verse 7. Howbeit the Lord would not destroy the house of David because of the covenant that he had made with David. And as he promised to give a light yes. to him and to his sons forever. forever. Amen. And so that can give us some encouragement that even though our own children and some of our children's children may not choose the Lord because <laughs> they're our children, the Lord is obligated to be a light for them. And that's why even Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 7 about even marriage, divorce, free marriage. Now, listen, if you're saved, and even though your mate and I may not be saved, but for, because you are that means now there's some hope for your children. Right. If your children didn't have a saved father or mother, then, then there would be no hope for them. Mm -hmm. There's no opportunity of light. I was blessed this week mm -hmm. to get to go back to my old place of employment. And they needed me to drive Friday afternoon, and so it was a blessing to see so many. And, of course, several of the ladies had to come give me a hug, and, mm -hmm. and they had to tell me about their kids because, like, one of the boys, he's growing up. And I had a great influence on him, yeah. and uh, and he's doing good. He's you know getting big, and he's mm -hmm. he's he's still sweet. He's not mean and angry like so many are teenagers. You know, teenagers are teenagers. Yeah, yeah. So it was a blessing. It was a real mm -hmm. blessing, you know, to see them. And then one of the ladies, uh, sure enough, sure enough, on my bus route, I had to take the kids home. A couple of the girls were formerly a part of my route, so I knew them well. They knew me well. They had a big smile on their faces. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when they got on the bus and when they got off the bus. And so it was a blessing. And then after the day was over and I'm cleaning out the bus, one of the newer drivers came to me and told me how a couple of her kids wanted her to tell me hi because they saw me from a distance. I said, oh, you must have my own route. She says, yeah, because, of course, that is the route nobody wants. And that's the route that 
the newer driver gets stuck with, you know. <laughs> I said, yeah, I drove that bus for seven years. She said, yeah, they get attached to you, you know, and it's just the truth, you know. And it's good to know we've had some influence on some people for the Lord, right. amen. And we've been a light, and uh, that's what it's all about. Amen. So many people want to be in a position of leadership, and yet uh, not too many qualify, amen? That's so true. And so David had been a lamp, and God was going to honor his word and his covenants with David. Amen. So that even it could continue to be a blessing to Israel and to his own children. And so let's continue mm -hmm. to look through here now. God granted mercy over several of David's sins because of his perfect heart and the sure mercies of God. Now we know David wasn't perfect. We can go back through his right. life and point right. out different times he made several errors. Yeah. Uh, and yet mm -hmm. the Bible here and just kind of wrapping up David's life for us tells us the only thing that was really a big issue with God was that thing with Uriah the Hittite right. and him murdering people right. just so he could fulfill his lust. Right. That's the thing that kind of stuck in God's craw, amen, yeah, right. as far as his own personal life with God. Yeah, he was a man after God's own heart, amen, and that's proof that God has a soldier's heart, amen, because mm -hmm. David was a soldier, brother, and... Uh, so look at Second Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7. Let's go back here and remind ourselves of David's life. 2 Samuel 7 and verse 12 mm -hmm. tells us, And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. Amen. Amen. Looking forward to, again, the kingdom that would be established there in Judah. And that if finally, again, someday, even the seed of David, Jesus, will come and rule the world. Amen. Verse 13. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Forever. See? Forever. And I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. Amen. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. forever. And God's throne is, even though, wait a minute, there ain't even no temple there today. What about that temple he built? Well, it's going to get rebuilt. Yeah. Just relax. Give it a, little, give it a few minutes. <laughs> Amen. 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 Yeah. Let's go to Psalms 32. Mm -hmm. Psalms 32. Let's see how David put it over here in Psalms 32. Psalms 32, 1, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, Amen. whose sin is covered. Blessed Amen. is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. Amen. And in whose spirit there is no guile. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So David knew the joy of having God's blessings, though he knew he did not deserve them. Yeah. And that's the key right there. Yes, sir. Look at Psalms 51. So many people think that they've got a cocky attitude towards God. Mm -hmm. And you can't be that way. No. He's going to honor those of a humble and contrite spirit. Mm -hmm. And so he said in 51.4, Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, mm -hmm. that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Mm -hmm. And so David knew that his sin was before God. And that's who he really had to answer to in everything that he did. Look at Isaiah chapter 55. His ways are above our ways, amen? Yes. And his thoughts above our thoughts. And he said in Isaiah 55 and verse 3, Incline thine ear and come unto me here, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even 
the sure mercies of David. So what we call eternal security in this dispensation of the grace of God and during this church age. See, David understood that, and David kind of got that a little bit. Uh, he was a precursor to what God would give us today. And so it is a wonderful thing to have the sure mercies of God, because not everybody in the Bible had that. For sure, King Saul did not have it. Because, of course, Jesus hadn't bled and died on the cross yet. Right. And that's the determiner that really makes it and breaks us for us so that Romans 8 is true. He that has not the Spirit of God, he's none of his. Mm -hmm. Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. Let's go down here to verse 34. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said in this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Mm -hmm. See, that's why if you're really saved, you ain't got nothing to worry about. Right. Because God's given you something that <laughs> the world don't get. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's sure mercies. See? Yeah. Not well only until you right. mess up again. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, no. <laughs> no, I've got the sure mercies. Amen? Mm -hmm. Amen. It's not like how you deal with the Democratic Party. All right, so let's move on here. Let's go down here now, pick it up at verse 9. And in the 20th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, reigned Asa. Hallelujah. Amen. And in the 20th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, reigned Asa over Judah. And 40 and one years reigned he in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Mecha, the daughter of of Abba Shalom, mm -hmm. and Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did David his father. Mm -hmm. And he took away the Sodomites out of the land. Mm -hmm. Amen. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. I guess if you've got enough airplanes and buses, you can pretty well send anybody anywhere you want, can't you? <laughs> yeah. And he took away the Sodomites out of the land and removed all the idols of his yeah. fathers had made that his father said made. And also Mecca, his mother, even her, he removed from being queen. Oh, she didn't like it like the picture shows you. She's resisting, amen? <laughs> she don't appreciate it. Because she, she enjoyed all that attention. She enjoyed all that glamour. He even re he removed her from being queen because she had made an idol in a grove. And you see the guys down below destroying the idols and mm -hmm. tearing it all up. Amen. And Asa destroyed her idol. Amen. Amen. God gives more preachers that can destroy people's idols. <laughs> of course, they're not very popular, you know, among the people. But as long as you're popular with God, that's what's going to count. Amen. Mm -hmm. And burn it by the brook Kidron. So they burned it outside the city walls by the stream that flowed out from under the temple. But the high places were not removed. Nevertheless, Asa's heart was perfect with the Lord all his days. So somehow the, excuse me, the hills and all those groves up there in the hills didn't necessarily get all cut down. But a lot of, there was a lot of cleanup during this revival under Asa. Amen. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. So Asa did right by expelling the Sodomites. Amen. Mm -hmm. Out of the land. Amen. So, buddy, they're tearing it up for Jesus. Amen. They got them big sledgehammers. They're getting rid of all those idols, grinding them to powder. Boy, that's a fun thing to do. You know, I love working with children and doing the junior church mm -hmm. for so many years because I loved going down there to the little statuary. Mm -hmm. I'm telegraphing, buying a bunch of statues, <laughs> and then putting a big drop cloth down on a Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, and then taking the hammer and busting all those things to pieces Amen. in front of those kids' eyes <laughs> to help them see how an idol is nothing. It ain't going to hurt you. Amen. Right. They could pull down that big old gold calf. Wasn't no lightning going to come out of the sky or out of the ground and kill nobody. Amen. 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 
That's just a stupid quote unquote aid to worship. <laughs> See, there you got a son, right? He looks like he's got a few stripes on him. Yeah, they're tearing it up. Mm -hmm. Amen. Cleaning the land, brother. Amen. Sure. Amen. Cleaning the land up. Cleaning up the land. That's interesting. No sodomite would exist if his or her parents believed like the sodomite. Exactly. Right. Exactly. You know, sodomite can't procreate. procreate. Amen. That's right. That's right. Though, of course, they're trying their best to get men where they can carry babies, you know. Why? Because that's the sodomite agenda. Right. See? Mm -hmm. But you could honestly say that under King Asa, God torched the faggots. Yeah. Amen? Amen, bro. Amen. And so they got rid of them. Yes. Amen. So, all the way back in Genesis 19, we see the first time and all of a sudden, this land of Sodom and Gomorrah, right. this city, mm -hmm. these cities of Sodom and Gomorrah in the, down in the plain there, and how God brought his judgment down in Genesis 19. Look at verse 24. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord, from the Lord. out of heaven. Amen. Yes, sir. That's right. And so... God knows how to put a stop to a thing. Look at the little book of Jude just before Revelation, mm -hmm. the last book of the Bible. And sure enough, verse 6, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains mm -hmm. under darkness unto the judgment of the great day, mm -hmm. even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, mm -hmm. are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Mm -hmm. Amen. Right. Amen. And so Asa, a great revival took place. Because Asa was determined to please the Lord in his life. Amen? Right. Amen. <laughs> and so he even removed his mother from being the queen with her idolatry. Mm -hmm. And uh, he got rid of the sodomites. He got rid of the idolatry and the false gods and the people worshiping the devil and the, all these false gods and all these statues mm -hmm. and images. And so, verse 14, but the high places were not removed. Nevertheless, Asa's heart was perfect with the Lord all his days. And he brought in the things which his father had dedicated and the things which himself had dedicated into the house of the Lord, silver and gold and vessels. And there was war between Asa and Basha, king of Israel, all their days. And Basha, king of Israel, went up against Judah mm -hmm. and built Ramah mm -hmm. that he might not suffer any to go out to come or come in to Asa, king of Judah. Then Asa took all the silver and the gold that were left in the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and delivered them into the hand of his servants. And king Asa sent them to Ben-Hadad, the son of Tebraman, the son of Hezion, mm -hmm. king of Syria, that dwelt at Damascus, saying, There's a league between me and thee. And so Asa did a smart thing. Not only did he clean up the land and get rid of all the queers and sodomites, mm -hmm. right. not only did he pull down all the idols of gold that the people were worshiping and that he stop people from having idols. He destroyed the idols, smashed them up into pieces. Even removed his own mother from being queen because mm -hmm. she'd set up her own idols and had her own <coughs> idols and he tore down all her idols as well. Mm -hmm. Now, 
with all the gold and silver he had collected, because again, we got all this gold from the golden calves and all this extra silver from all these people's silver shrines and stuff of all their stupid religious activity worshiping the devil. So now he gets together all that extra gold he's got and extra silver, and then he ships it to Syria, to Damascus, and says, hey, king, old buddy, old pal, old friend, I'm going to give you a little gift. So we're at 1 Kings 15. Uh, since me and you are pals, and I'm giving you all this silver and gold, would you do me a favor and come on down south and uh, whip Basha for me. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty busy down here in the south, cleaning house down here and having revival in the land of Judah. Would you go through Israel for me and just clean their plow, just knock their blocks off, you know, just put out their headlights or whatever you call that, put out their lights. <laughs> and so it's not, nevertheless, obviously it was a substantial sum that he was easily bought, amen? He was easily bought. Uh -huh. He said, yeah, I'll be happy to do that for you. Uh -huh. My, my, if you're willing to pay up like this, man, what else might I get if I go down through there and tear that place up? So we're at 1 Kings 15, 19. There is a league between me and thee and between my father and thy father. Behold, I have sent unto thee a present of silver and gold. Come and break thy league with Basha, king of Israel, that he may depart from me. So Ben-Hadad hearkened unto King Asa and sent the captains of the hosts which he had against the cities of Israel and smote I, John, and Dan, and Abel, Beth Mekah, and all Chinneroth, with all the land of Naphtali. Mm -hmm. And it came to pass, when Basha heard thereof, that he left off building of Ramah, and dwelt in Terzah. Then King Asa made a proclamation throughout all Judah, none was exempted, and they took away the stones of Ramah, and the timber thereof, wherewith Basha had built it, and King Asa built with them, Geba of Benjamin and Mizpah. The rest of all the acts of Asa and all his might and all that he did and the cities which he built, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? Nevertheless, in the time of his old age, he was diseased in his feet. And Asa slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, his father. And Jehoshaphat, his son, reigned in his stead. Mm -hmm. And Nadab, the son of Jeho uh, Jeroboam, began to reign over Israel in the second year of Asa, king of Judah, and reigned over Israel two years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father and in his sin, wherewith he made Israel to sin. And Basha, the son of Ahijah, the, the, of the house of Issachar, conspired against him. And Basha smote him at Gib Gibbethon, which belonged to the Philistines for Nadab and all Israel laid siege to Gibbethon. Even in the third year of Asa, king of Judah, did Basha slay him and reign in his stead. And it came to pass when he reigned that he smote all the house of Jeroboam. He left not to Jeroboam any that breathed until he had destroyed him according unto the saying of the Lord, which he spake by his servant Ahijah, the Shilonite, remember that way back there? When we read that at the very beginning in chapter 14? No, even before that, back in chapter 13, that's when that was. Verse 30, because of the sins of Jeroboam which he sinned, in which he made Israel sin by his provocation wherewith he provoked the Lord God of Israel to anger. And so, again, that gives us hope today because we see that God is watching. He sees the leadership we have in our nation and how wicked they are. Right. We're so concerned. Mr. Trump may have had a library book that he's not supposed to have, so we're going to send in the FBI see if we can find that library book. <laughs> We've got to get him in trouble any way we can. And yet the president's own son's allowed to smoke dope and Co uh, snuff cocaine and videotape himself with whores and prostitutes and all kinds of other terrible things 
And he's totally free. The FBI ain't investigating nothing. And though it's all on some laptops, everybody's pretending that, that they don't even exist. Why is there this double standard? Because somebody thinks they're bigger than God, but yeah. they're not bigger than God. And Amen. God's watching all the time. Amen. That's true. And so we're living in similar days that we can watch as God is not pleased with our nation. And God is being provoked to anger. Mm -hmm. Amen. Verse 31. Now the rest of the acts of Nadab and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? And there was war between Asa and Basha, king of Israel, all their days. And in the third year of Asa, king of Judah, began Basha, the son of Ahijah, to reign over all Israel in Terzah twenty and four years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of Jeroboam and in his sin, wherewith he made Israel to sin. So though these kings are coming and going, so though the sons of these great men end up being trashier than their fathers <laughs> and worse than their fathers, yet, thank God, God's got a light and a lamp in Jerusalem, like it said about David and David's seed. Verse 4 of chapter 15. And so God has still got a light going. Amen. People can look back and remember back when God's blessing was on them as a nation under King David. Mm -hmm. And certainly with this great grandson of David, Asa, coming along and him trying to revive and clean up the nation, getting rid of the Sodomites, getting rid of the queen. It gave all of the people some hope that, yes, God is going to honor us someday as a nation again. Because God is obligated by his word to honor us if we honor him. Amen? Amen. Now, we're going to see, though, God is going to raise up. If God can't use a king, then he'll just use a prophet. He'll raise up a preacher somewhere. And so let's continue in 1 Kings 16 and verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to Jehu, the son of Hanani, against Basha, saying, For as much... As I exalted thee out of the dust and made thee prince over my people Israel, and thou hast walked in the way of Jeroboam, and hast made my people Israel to sin, to provoke me to anger with their sins, behold, I will take away the posterity of Basha and the posterity of his house, and will make thy house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat. Now, since, again, they were able to finally kill all of Jeroboam's family so that nobody could ever claim that throne, now God's justice is coming to the house of Basha, and now he's going to have the same thing happen to his house. Here he thinks he was so much better, and somehow God's going to bless him because God did allow him to step into the position of being the king of the northern tribes of Israel. Well, guess what? Because he ain't doing right. God's given him the promise that, well, guess what? I'm going to require the same thing of you, clown. Right. If you can't walk the walk as well as talk the talk, then I'm not interested in having you be the man. Right. And so we're going to see God's judgments on him. Amen? Mm -hmm. And so the Bible says, verse 4, Him that dieth of Basha in the city shall the dogs eat. Mm -hmm. And him that dieth of his in the field shall the fowls of the earth eat. Now to a Jew... To a God-fearing Jew who feared, he feared the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. See, it was a big deal that you wanted to properly honor God by letting your body be buried in a right. cave or in the right. ground because you knew someday God's promised you a resurrection. Mm -hmm. It was very important to the Jews that their body properly be buried. And to be honest, if you know any honest to God real Jews, you know that they don't even believe in uh, being embalmed. Right, right, That's right. If you're a Jew and you die, they immediately lay you out and put candles around and sit down and have a wake for you. But within 24 hours, you're buried. Because mm -hmm. they think it's more honoring to God. Right. Well, they honor God in their burial. At the same time, they don't make so much of the dead flesh that they embalm it and think, well, let's preserve it and make, make it last as long as it can in the grave and in the coffin. No, no, no. Right. And most Jews... They put them in pine boxes, number one. Nobody's 
a Jew's not spending a thousand dollars for a metal box. Are you nuts? <laughs> <laughs> so number one, they put them in a pine box, and number two, they never leave them out from being buried more than 24 hours, and within 24 hours, they put them in the ground. Now, what do you think about these people getting cremated? Do you think they'll? Well, again, it's very popular in our society because it keeps the costs down too. Yeah. Everybody thinks they got to hire the mortician and the funeral home to take care of them, and so it's they make they make sure it's cheaper just to burn them up. See, and of course that's real handy for Louisiana. Now, you know, for centuries people in Louisiana, and you know the the, the Mississippi River floods every year, real yeah. bad. And in Mississippi, they've always had a problem with coffins floating around. Mm. When the Mississippi gets out of banks, uh -huh. so you know down in Louisiana and Mississippi, they they made mausoleums popular. So they buried them above ground because they could maybe make a cement structure at least keep it from washing into the Gulf of Mexico. Mm -hmm. But uh, needless to say, cremating the dead is real popular in Louisiana because they ain't got no room for nobody. Mm -hmm. You know. So they give you the ashes. Here's your, here's your mamma and papa. Oh, how sweet. I'll put that on the fireplace. You know, but when you die, your soul automatically goes to heaven. Well, of course, your soul and spirit, yeah. It, 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 of course, amen. to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm. Isn't that what Paul said? Yep. So we know that in the invisible part of us, the soul and spirit, is the real us. You know. Right. Mm -hmm. And the only time you ever look at my soul is when you're looking in my eyes. You know, because... Right. The eyes, the window of the soul. Mm -hmm. So, so cremation, of course, uh, gets rid of the body real quick. And certainly, God is able to raise you from the dead. He knows where every little particle of your body is, even if you did burn it in the fire. You know, that's why the Bible says, "Then the sea gave up the dead that were in them." Because for centuries, people have been buried at sea and eat up by whales and sharks, and you know. Yeah. Tadpoles and everything else. Kelly, Kelly, Kelly says she wants to be cremated and then poured in the sea and swim with the turtles. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Probably swallowed by the turtles. Yeah. <laughs> so God knows where all of us is. And the truth is, the Bible seems to indicate that because our body has once had in it the indwelling Holy Spirit of God, see, that's what makes that body redeemable. Because, see, once the Lord's Spirit moved into it and because that spirit of the Lord has been in me then he knows how to bring me back to life and build, put me in a, in a human body and resurrect me out of here so there's nothing too big for God and we're not saying that cremation stops the process again see there was a time when people honestly taught for instance all the people that were infidels uh, and infrahel people like Thomas Paine and these fellows they all thought, boy, when I die, I'm going to be cremated. I don't, I'm not interested in standing before God on no day of judgment. They thought somehow they would keep God from raising them from the dead. And so it was very popular back in the founding of our nation for the right. infidel people to say, I want to be cremated. I don't want to be buried. But guess what? That ain't going to stop God from raising you from the dead. He'll still raise you from the dead. Uh -huh. You know, yeah. Yeah. whether or not you're eaten by a fish or burned in a fire don't mean nothing to God. Right. Yeah. If, they, if they ain't been saved. And they get cremated, their little ashes will float right down the hill and be burnt. Well, no, he's going to raise <laughs> No, in the book of John, Jesus made it clear. Even the lost people are going to be raised from the dead. Right. And they're going to stand before the Lord on the day of judgment. Right. So, so God's word is true, and we, we're going to hold to that truth. And yes, if you and your family want to go the cheap way and just burn you up, then that's your best, that's between you and God. Right. But now myself, I'd rather be buried. I'd rather go through all that trouble and spend all that money because I believe, like the Jews, it's just a little bit more honoring to God and His resurrection. Right. And so, that's kind of how they did things. Mm -hmm. And it was very much an insult to a Jew if you'd say, "Hey, we're going to kill you and just leave you out there and let the dogs eat you." Right. Well, no, no, because I'm going to try to honor God with my body. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't want dogs eat me. You know, right. mm -hmm. right. I'd rather you honor me, at least put me under the ground so I can see the Lord on the resurrection day a little quick. And so it was a great insult. 
that God would tell this king, hey, the dogs are going to come and eat you. And him that dieth of his in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. Mm -hmm. See, God thinks so much less of you, see, that he's not going to honor you with any other, other birth. And the truth is, he'd just soon get rid of your body. He, he ain't interested in raising you from the dead. Now, this is the implication, and this is the biggest thing to the Jews. The Jews always thought the worst thing could ever be is if the Lord comes back and raises all his people from the dead and you're left behind because you're just some of the dirt of the earth and you're just some of the worm feed and he ain't interested in you at all, see? Mm -hmm. And this is implied throughout the Old Testament, even when you go back to what these giants are in Genesis 6 and the fallen angels and how that says in Job, the dead things are formed under the waters and the inhabitants thereof. See, the Bible suggests that all these monsters and all these things like Bigfoots and all these UFO occupants and stuff, these things are of the devil and they're having to do with death. And they're of the death. It's, it's dead things formed under the waters, like it says in Job. So these things are from, like, like from death and they're going to death. And the Bible is always, especially in the Old Testament, it always says how, yes, there are some things out here walking around and even living, but they are of the devil and they are of death and God is never going to raise them from the dead. And that was the biggest insult and slap God could give anyone in the Old Testament is you're so much a nothing with God that he wouldn't even waste time raising you from the dead. And, they, and this is uh, the insult in the scriptures. And so that's why it says it here. He's telling this king, yeah, you're such a, you think you're so proud and brigady. You're somebody. But guess what? You know, at least the Queen of England even. Now they're going to ship her body over here and let us all clap and faint over it, you know, because she's the Queen of England, you know. And, and there was a time we all, because it was a big deal, of, well, Mr. Trump's going to be allowed to go see her because, of course, he, he knew her personally, see? But for somebody to say, oh, you're going to be so much a nobody, nothing, even dogs are going to come and eat you up and just, dump you out there in the field and you ain't going to be nothing to God. He's going to let the birds come along and eat your little pieces of you up because you ain't nothing with God. You don't register with God. You don't rate. Wow. That's the greatest insult you could get of somebody like, you know, Brandon. <laughs> Verse 5, now the rest of the acts of Basha and what he did and his might, are they not written? the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. So Basha slept with his fathers and, his, and was buried in Terza, and Elah his son reigned in his stead, and also by the hand of the prophet Jehu, the son of Hanani, came the word of the Lord against Basha and against his house, even for all the evil that he did in the sight of the Lord, in provoking him to anger with the work of his hands, in being like the house of Jeroboam, and because he killed him. See, see, God killed him. Amen. God had no use for him. He was not a good king. Verse 8, in, in the twenty and sixth year of Asa, king of Judah, began Elah, the son of Basha, to reign over Israel in Terza two years. And his servant Zimri, captain of half his chariots conspired against him as he was in Terza drinking himself drunk in the house of Arza, steward of his house in Terza. And Zimri went in and smote him and killed him in the twenty and seventh year of Asa, king of Judah, and reigned in his stead. So the next guy that come along wasn't no better. So even the captain of over half his chariots got drunk one night, and he just walked on in there and killed that king. Because he was no better a man, and God would, would rather that happen than that guy stays in charge. And that's how, and that's how, that's how big God, God is. See, you can't even account, well, what? this guy was drunk, and he was drinking. Yeah, but see, God can even make the devil do his work. Yes. <laughs> It's not a, not a big deal to God. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And God has a place for everybody, including even bad people. Yep. 
Romans 8, 28 is still in the Bible. For all things work together for good to those who love God, to those that are called according to his purpose. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, that looks like a good place to stop. So let's stop there at verse 10, and then we'll pick it up at 11 next week. Amen. Because, again, we're getting to see now the Bible's running us through these names, and I know it can get really easily uh, confusing because... Uh, here this guy reigns for two years and this guy's dead and then this guy reigns for two four years and, and so we see these two different kingdoms again let's go back to the beginning we see these two different kingdoms you got the northern kingdoms that again they, they they're the ones that took off first and decided ah oh, we don't need to worship God in Jerusalem and at the temple we'll go on up here and do our own thing we'll be our own nation that's the northern tribes. That's the Yankee tribes. But meantime, the southern tribes of Benjamin and Judah stayed true to God, or tried to, though their kings weren't the best. And at least the, their king was the son of David, but he wasn't no count, but the grandson of David was better. Asa was a better man. And so there was a revival. At least they cleaned up the land and got rid of all them golden calves and stuff for a little while. But even with his, the queen, even no good. You know, they had to just clean house. But now they're going to be back and forth, different kings, and they're always fighting each other. And sometimes there'll be a good one here and a bad one. Most of the time, there's all bad ones <laughs> right. on both ends. But a few good ones, especially down south. But God's going to raise up the prophets. See, now all of a sudden, here comes right. Elijah. Right. And Elijah, the prophet's going to be a thorn in that king's side. And there's that time that king wants to do something wrong he's going to be saying now look here king boy that king's going to be out to kill him he ain't going to like the message so he's going to try to kill the messenger so Elijah is going to be the prophet of God and then here comes Elisha next mm -hmm. and the God's going to greatly use these two men during these conflicts between north and south and community of nations too uh, like Syria right. when Naaman the leper is involved right. and so forth so on because again uh, they still have to contend with some of the Gentile nations as well so it'll get more and more interesting very good all right let's stay in bow our heads in prayer now father we're so thankful for this chance we've got to look at these Old Testament characters and how you use them to build the nations and yet Lord uh, if they weren't good men of course they all the more deserved your wrath and your judgment. Mm -hmm. And uh, Lord, help us as individuals in the day we're living in to see that, yes, we're in a rough nation too. It ain't too good. But in the end, Lord, you know who loves you and you know we, we do. Mm -hmm. And you're going to look for, out for us. And help us to do our best for you in this hour. And in Jesus' name we ask it. And amen.